name is Grace Egbo and welcome to this presentation which is entitled 2520 Fact or Fiction. Now the reason why I'm doing this presentation is because I get a lot of questions, um, emails, comments, people ask me about the 2520, um, wanting to know my views on it, telling me it's error, telling me it's occult teaching and so on. And in past times, I've never really addressed this. I've never felt impressed to do a presentation on the 2520, to be honest, because I think there's so many websites out there and other presentations which do a good job of it and go into it in greater detail. But, but because of the last few comments I've got, I feel a bit more impressed by the law to do a presentation on it, something very briefly, just to talk about what it is, basically, because... It seems like a lot of people don't understand really what a 2520 is, you know, how it came about. And also to address the common arguments against the 2520. It's going to be brief, so if you do want to study it more, I will put some links um, below and you can do a bit more research on the 2520 if you feel more impressed to do it. So, let us begin. And the best way we can begin is by explaining what the 2520 is. So what is the 2520? Well, if you turn in your Bible to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 26, this is where the term 2520 stems from. You see, in Leviticus chapter 26, Moses speaks of the blessing that will fall upon Israel if they obeyed his covenant and the curses that will fall upon them if they didn't. And within the curses, a time period of seven times is given and you find this period seven times written quite frequently in Leviticus chapter 26. The Lord basically telling them he will punish them seven times if they didn't hearken unto the words of his covenant. Now through the use of the term times being used, we understand that prophetic period is being denoted here. For example, if we were to turn into Revelation 12 chapter 14, it speaks of the woman, the woman found into the wilderness and the time period is given, you know, where she's nourished in the wilderness and that time period is a time, times and half a time. And many of us as Adventists who have studied these things, we know for sure that this time, times and half a time relates to the time period when Papal Rome was persecuting God's church, and represents the church, so the church, you know, flee unto the wilderness, God's protection, a place of seclusion, where he protected them from the evils of the papacy who were ruling at that time period. And that time period that was given is the 1260 years, the time period from 538 to 1798. I covered this in a previous presentation, if you're not familiar with this, the second presentation, the prophecy series, which is called the Millerites in 1844. So if you're not familiar with this, I do go into it in greater detail. But note that it likens the 1260 years corresponding to the time, times and half a time, as you can see in Revelation 12, 6, if you parallel the two. Revelation 12, 6 with Revelation 12, 14 is speaking about the same time period. And we understand that a time represents a year, times represents two years, and half a time represents half a year, so we get three and a half years. So when the Bible talks of seven times, we understand that it's referring to seven years. And in Bible prophecy, we know that a day equals a year, and one year corresponds to 360 days. We go by the Jewish reckoning calendar, the Jewish calendar, one year is 360 days. So if you do the addition, the calculation, seven times 360, you get 2520. So that's where the term 2520 comes about. And it was the time period when um, the church was going to be um, punished. Israel, during that time period, remember Israel constitutes to God's children, you know, both literal Israel and also spiritual Israel, you know, the time of the Gentiles, when they were going to be scattered because of, you know, of not hearkening unto the covenant of the Lord. And what you find interesting is that this time period is illustrated in the 1843 chart. I'll go on to explain about the 1843. 1843 chart in the moment but here you also see the calculations is what our founders believed in um, um same time period which equals 25 20 it's just that they've calculated it differently they've gone by months seven times 12 months equals 84 months 84 times 30 equals 25 20 you know same principle we use the day for a year principle remember in bible prophecy a day equals a year you get 25 20 
And if you're not familiar with the day for year printable, you can find it in Numbers 14, 34 and Ezekiel 4, 6, you know, each day for a year. And if you're not familiar with these things, I'm going over it very briefly, please do go back to the second presentation in this series called the Millerites in 1844, where I'll go into this step by step and you'll see that the day for year principle didn't originate with William Miller or the Millerites. Um, it, it was established way centuries before they even came to existence. It's sound in the Bible and I'll go into that in my uh, second presentation, the Millerites in 1844. So if you're not familiar with it, please do go back and watch that presentation. So, continuing on, the question we need to ask ourselves is, you know, how, where do we start this 25-20 year, you know? You know, what time period do we give when the scattering began? Well, according to William Miller, you know, who did his research, he concludes that this time commenced in 677 BC with Manasseh, when Manasseh was um, taken captive. According to Chronologer, that's when Babylon came and, you know, scattered to people. 677. So then when you do the calculation, you add 2520 to 677, it takes you to 1844, 1843, 1844. And that's how he understood the time period being. And this gave more power to his message, you know, because he had two witnesses which established, you know, that something important was going to happen in 1844. You had the 2,300 day prophecy. And now you had the 2520, or shall I say 2520, because that's what he understood first. And then he had the 2,300 day pros, which gave more power to the message. So that's what was his understanding. It began with the southern tribe, Manasseh, 7677 to uh, down to 1843, 1844. Then later on, you know, after the great disappointment, Hiram Edson came along. And then he said that, you know, the 2520 actually commenced in 723 with Hosea the northern time period so he was basically saying that you know 2520 started in 723 bc and then when you do the addition you know 2520 you know it takes you to 1798 and that was his argument so it's like we have two 2520s so who was right well they were both right because when you do your studies you find that israel was split into two because of the sins of solomon you had the northern tribe israel reigning and then you had the southern tribe which consisted of the two other tribes and if you're not familiar with this you can read uh first kings chapter 11 verse 28 to 31 where it clearly tells you that israel was split into two because of the sins of solomon um i'll just read in your hearing it tells us and the man jeroboam was a mighty man of bala and solomon seen the young man that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. And it came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the Shunammite found him in the way, and he had clad himself with a new garment, and they too were alone in the field. And Hajijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in twelve pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, Take thee ten pieces. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, I will rend the kingdom out of the hands of Solomon and will give ten tribes to thee. So he gave ten tribes to, you know, Jeroboam, and then Israel was just left with two, Solomon, you know, just for the benefit of David. So when you do the calculations, the dates are amazing. 723, um, northern tribe was scattered, ends in 1798. And then you've got spiritual, then you've got, sorry, and then you've got uh, the Southern Kingdom, which was taken to captivity, 677 to 1844. And you can see this clearly illustrated on this chart, where it tells us this. I mean, it amazes me, to be honest, how people can doubt the 2520, because the calculation is just so precise. I mean, come on. I mean, when you do the addition, 723 takes you to 1798. Southern tribe taken captive takes you to 1844. Between the two, you have 46 years, 46 years, and during that time period, what was the Lord doing? He was building up his church, spiritual Israel, the Adventist church. You know, we can see the parallel, you know, with the ancient temple, you know, during Herod's time, it took 46 years to build that temple. So even that even adds more power to it. You know, 1798, that was the end of the 1260 years as well. And then, you know, God was now taking his church spiritually, you know, out of Babylon, you know. He was bringing them into the law, the covenant, the Ten Commandments. That was established in 1844 when he moved from the 
holy place, the most holy place they saw his covenant. So even when you look at the chart, this chart here, it's just so precise, so accurate, and it gives power. It gives power to the message that we proclaim. And also, when you look at the northern tribe, you've got the 1,260 years, you know, ends in 538. You know, what happens there? You know, papacy starts to rule in. You've got the pag paganism, which trampled down God's church for a time period. You know, Israel was in bondage to Rome. We see that clearly even when Christ came. And also, the same thing with the papacy, the trampling down of God's church. Why? Because they didn't hearken unto the words of his covenant. So it's so powerful when we see these things and understand these things. And as I mentioned, you see that 2520 illustrated on the chart. And speaking of this chart, Ellen White tells us, I thought the truth should be made plain upon tables, that the earth and the fullness thereof is the Lord, and that necessary means should not be spared, to, and that necessary means should not be spared to make it plain. I thought that the old chart was directed by the Lord and that a figure of it should and that and that not a figure of it should be altered except by inspiration. I thought the figures of the chart were as God would have them and that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures so that none should see it till his hand was removed. Now note that she tells us that there was a mistake in the figures. Now she says, you know, mistake in, you know, indicating one mistake that was in a number of the figures. Now, what mistake is this? And note she said this mistake should not be altered except by inspiration. Now, what mistake is this we need to ask ourselves? Well, she tells us this herself in her writings. She tells us, Jesus and all the heavenly hosts looked with sympathy and love upon those who had with sweet expectation longed to see him who their souls loved. Angels were hovering around them to sustain them in the hour of their trial. Now she's talking about the great disappointment here. Those who had neglected to receive the heavenly message were left in darkness and God's anger was kindled against them because they would not receive the light which he had sent them from heaven. Those faithful disappointed ones who could not understand why their Lord did not come were not left in darkness. Again, they were led to their Bibles to search the prophetic periods. The hand of the Lord was removed from the figures and the mistake was explained. Now, what mistake is this? She tells us. She said, they saw that the prophetic periods reached to 1844 and that the same evidence which they had presented to show that the prophetic periods closed in 1843 proved that they would terminate in 1844. So what was the issue here? It was a miscalculation, right? In the figures, not in the message that was proclaiming. She continues, light from the word of God shone upon their position and they discovered a tarrying time. Don't it the vision tarry, wait for it. In their love for Christ's immediate coming, they had overlooked the tearing of the vision, which was calculated to manifest as true waiting ones. Again, they had a point of time. Yet I saw that many of them could not rise above their severe disappointment to possess that degree of zeal and energy which had marked their faith in 1843. Early writings 235 to 236. So what was the mistake here? She tells us clearly it was a miscalculation in the figures. The fact that they thought that the Lord was going to come in 1843, when instead it was 1844. Now, they didn't understand the Tarian time until later on. And to further confirm this, we see that this mistake was rectified later on in the 1850 chart, which Ellen White again tells us was directed by the Lord. It was instructed by the Lord. And in the 1850 chart, you also see the 2520. So the mistake is rectified as well because you see that the time period no longer ends in 1843, but is in 1844. This was the correction that was given by inspiration. Now speaking on this chart, we are told, I saw that God was in the publishment of the chart by Brother Nichols. I thought there was a prophecy of this chart in the Bible. And if this chart is designed for God's people, if it is sufficient for one, it is for another. And if one needed a new chart page on a larger scale, 
or need it just as much. Again, she tells us, God showed me the necessity of getting out a chart. I saw it was needed and that the truth made plain upon tables would affect much and would cause souls to come to knowledge of the truth. On our return to Brother Nicol, the Lord gave me a vision, this is the correction by inspiration, and showed me that the truth must be made plain upon tables and it will cause many to decide for the truth by the third angel's message, with the two former being made plain upon tables. I saw I also saw it was a necessity it was a necessary, necessary for the paper to be published as the messages to go for to go for the messengers need a paper to carry with them containing present truth to put in the hands of those who would hear and then the truth would not fade from their minds and that the paper would go where the messages could not go. Five manuscript releases two oh three paragraph one. So here we see clearly what the mistake was and you know she corrects it, is corrected by inspiration. Two charts endorsed by the Lord. Now, um, a while ago, I think it was about a month ago, I came across an article which was on the Secret Unsealed website, um, which is owned by Stephen Bohr. And the article, you know, I think it was a transcript of Dwayne Lemon's uh, sermon on the 2520. And um, he put a very inter interesting argument in regard to 2520. And he said that, you know, in terms of Uriah Smith's books, Daniel Revelation, Ellen White endorses that book, she calls it God's helping hand. Nevertheless, we know that there are errors in that book in regards to Daniel 11, 40 to 45. You know, it says it's Turkey when we know it's Rome. You know, he goes completely way off. So he says that, you know, Ellen White can, and she never, like, corrected him, is what he said. And that um, it's the same thing for the 1843 chart, he said, you know, that, saying basically the spirit of prophecy can still endorse something when there's error in it because you know according to him that's what um she did with um he writes me book daniel and revelation however i beg to disagree with that statement because she does correct uh Uriah smith's error in regards to daniel and 40 to 45 in her writings 30 manuscripts you know she indirectly tells us that the king of the north is the papacy and I covered that in the previous presentation, Dane 11, 40 to 45. Um, you read her quote in 30 manuscript releases, where she talks about um, Dane 11, 30 to 36 being repeated, the power being grieved, that it shall return. You know, when you study it, you know, you see clearly without a doubt she's referring to Rome rising again, King of the North, as illustrated in Dane 11, 40 to 45. I've discussed that in previous presentations. So she does correct that, you know, she does, you know, address that issue. You know, and we also need to understand that Daniel 40 to 45, you know, really, really wasn't their time. And in, in Uriah Smith's book, Daniel Revelation, he's got some good histories, you know, which, you know, which are important for us to understand. And with, and in regards to um, the charts, this is something different because she doesn't acknowledge that there being error. In fact, she says it was directed, you know, by the hand of the Lord. And he also made the point that, you know, the reason why she doesn't correct the error um, in the chart is because, you know, we need to focus on bigger issues here, i.e. Um, the fed angel's message and the testimony of Jesus. And I thought to myself, what they failed to understand, that what's being attacked here in regards to 2520 and Ellen White's teaching is the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus, because we are taught the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And that gift we see manifested through Ellen White. And by us questioning 2520, we are actually questioning the spirit that instructed her. Now, why do I say this? Well, I want to read a statement which I believe destroys all arguments in regards to the 2520. And I think it seals it, it hits a nail on the head where, you know, she tells us that 2520, you know, was valid and was that the date was actually instructed by God through his angel. I'll read in your hearing. She tells us, God sent his angel I repeat, God sent his angel to move upon the heart of a farmer, William Miller, who had not believed in the Bible, to lead him to search the prophecies. Angels of God repeatedly visited that chosen one to guide his mind and open to his understanding prophecies that had ever been dark to God's people. The commencement of the chain of truth was given to him, 
and he was led to search for link after link until he looked with wonder and admiration upon the word of God. He saw there a perfect chain of truth. So note that she says that God sent his angel and instructed William Miller and this angel gave him the commencement of the chain of truth, the commencement of the timing of the prophecies. Now what commencement dates were given to William Miller? Well, he tells us this, he tells us in his writings, from a further study of the scriptures, I concluded that the seven times of the Gentile supremacy must commence when the Jews ceased to be an independent nation at the captivity of Manasseh, which the best chronicles assigned to 677 BC. What did he just say there? What was the first prophecy understand? What was the commencement date given to him? By his angel, according to the spirit of the Lord? 677. He continues, a 2,500 day commenced with the 70 weeks, which the best chronologers dated from BC 457, and that the 1,335 days commencing with the taking away of the daily and the setting up of the abomination which made of desolate, Daniel 12.4, were to be dated from the setting up of the papal supremacy after the taking away of the pagan abominations, and which, according to the best historians, I could consult should be dated from around AD 508. But reckoning all these prophetic periods from the several dates assigned to the best chronologers for the event from which they could evidently be reckoned, they all would terminate together around 1843. I was thus brought in 1880 at the close of my two years study of the scriptures to the solemn conclusion that in about 25 years from that time all the affairs of our present state would be wound up William Miller. So what were the three commencement dates given to him which were instructed by his angel? She tells us 677, 457, 508 instructed by his angel the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. I mean, in Revelation chapter 1, we are told, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants, which things must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto the servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and all things that he saw. So what's been attacked here, really and truly? Is the testimony of Jesus. We're actually questioning Ellen White's authority because she tells us clearly that God sent his angel to give him those dates. And today we want to say, oh no, those dates are not valid. Why? Because James White rejected it and because Uriah Smith rejected it. You know, who are we following? Are we following man or are we following God? And I think these things are there. God allows these things to happen to test us, to see who we're following because it's so clear. I mean, even without the spirit of prophecy, even when we looked at the chart, we look at those dates, they're so precise and so accurate and they give power to the message that we proclaim, but yet we still want to question these things. And note that William Miller was a serious Bible student. He studied these things for years, but many of us studied 2520, what, for five minutes, for one day, and then we come to our own foolish conclusions? I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. And I can't understand why so many people are against the 2520. I mean, when you think about it, what damage does it do to the Adventism? Does it damage our message in any way? No, it doesn't. In my opinion, I think it gives power to the message, but yet we still want to moan and complain and say it's a cult teaching and say it's error and so on. And, you know, we don't understand that we are actually questioning the spirit of the Lord. We are actually test questioning the testimony of Jesus Christ. Because for Ellen White now to recount the 2520, the foundations of our faith is to doubt the work of God, you know, and that doesn't make sense. She, she never did, you know, so we need to stop bringing these foolish arguments, you know, to the table and look at the bigger picture at hand. Now, another argument which I want to look at, which many people use to try and disprove the 2520, is found in a comment Ellen White wrote in regards to the Review and Herald, and that's found in eight manuscripts 
Page 221, paragraph 2. She says, Then I saw that the papers the review and herald would go, and that it would be the means of bringing souls to a knowledge of the truth. I saw that James had not bore the burden alone, but that angels of God had assisted and had oversight of the paper. 8 Manuscript 221, paragraph 2. And of this oversight which angels had, you'll find that uh, James Ware, you know, published an article about 1850 where he speaks about 2520 and he's in agreement with, you know, what William Miller said the chron from the chronologist 677 and so on. So we know that um, James White did believe in 2520 at that point, but then in about 1863, you know, he recounted his position on the 2520. And because of this, um, many people said, you know, oh, you know, Ellen White said that, you know, angels, you know, assisted the paper that James was writing. And then, you know, 1850, you know, he supports 2520, but in 1863, he now writes an argument against 2520 saying there's no prophecy. So, you know, you know, we go by what James White said. But sometimes we need to look at the bigger picture and see what's happening here. Now I want to read this statement which Ellen White wrote in 1863 in regards to the mindset of James White. The same year when he published that article about the 2520, it being error and it not being the time prophecy. This is what she tells us. This is written in June 6, 1863. She tells us, I was shown that our testimony is still needed in the church and that we should labour to save ourselves trials and cares and that we should preserve a devotional frame of mind. It is the duty of those in the office to tax their brains more and of my husband to tax his less. Much time is spent by him upon various matters which what? Confuse and weary his mind and unfit him for study or for writing and thus prevent his light from shining the review and herald as it should. So, where, so what was James White's state of mind at that time period? What did you tell us? He was confused, he was weary, and because of that mindset, he was really unfit for writing. You know, the same year he published that article in regards to the 2520, where he now attacked, you know, one of the key foundations of the faith. She continues, My husband's mind should not be crowded and overtaxed. It must have rest, and he must be left free to write and attend to matters which others cannot do those engaged in the office should lift from him a great weight of care if they will dedicate themselves to god and feel a deep interest in the work written in june 6 1863 you can find the three testimonies 11 16. now i mean so what are you more inclined to believe i mean in terms of james white frame of mind i'm more inclined to go with you know 1850 when you know he wasn't under such pressure at that time period you know, and I'll read a statement later on where Ellen White says that we should let nothing come in the foundation of the fact that they were built in 1842, 43, 44, and so on. You know, and you know, it was after 1863 and so on, that's when we see like a lot of um, apostates and a lot of attacks on the foundations of the faith now coming in. You know, Satan, you know, now working, you know. So I'm just saying, you know, we need to be careful not to study these things all right here. I'd like to read um, a statement where someone comments on this, you know, this article that um, James White wrote and Ellen White's comments, the one which I just read. And the reason I'm quoting from him is because I like the way he explained it. I think he explains it really well. And um, I don't think I can do a better job. I don't want to, like, you know, say it and certain things not come out how I want it to come out. But this article, it's a really, really good article and I recommend that you uh, read it all of it. It's found on the Path of the Just website. An article is called Considering the 1863 Chart Part 1. I'm just going to read what he said in the article that he wrote. This is what he says. She goes, She wrote that her husband was overtaxed with duties of his office and his light was hindered from shining in the Review and Herald as it should. In fact, she said he was in a state that rendered him unfit for the study of writing. She was calling for brethren to lift the burdens that were on her husband's shoulders because they were unfitting his mind for the work God desired him to accomplish. And in the very same year, 
in the very same month that she voiced great concern for her husband in his overtaxed condition, he published the 1863 charm. It may be true that one of the recognised champions of our faith and others eventually spoke against the 2520, but can the cause of any human being, however led of God, override the plain and positive testimony of the Holy Spirit, which has spoken through the prophet? The argument that 2520 is false because men later rejected it is at its core placing of trust in the words of fallible men over the words of God. And those who build their understanding on such a foundation are preparing themselves to receive the mark of the beast. If the words of men are accepted over the words of inspiration now, such a cause will be even easier to follow in a time when every force within society will be arrayed against God's people and against the truth. And I think he summarises that perfectly. I mean, I mean, people that argue against 2520, James White said this, Uriah Smith said that. In my mind, don't show me what Uriah Smith and what James White wrote. Tell me what the Bible and Ellen White say. I mean, I'm not saying that we shouldn't listen to what the pioneers wrote. I think there's some great stuff in their writings. But when there appears to be a bit of like confusion or people unsure, or when they're saying certain things which don't really align with what the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy said, we take the Bible. We take the testimony of Jesus, we take the spirit of prophecy as the garden authority. No matter how wise these men may sound across when they put their arguments forth. And when you look at their arguments, Uriah Smiths, or even James White on the 12th of time, when you study it, you see that really that, you know, it doesn't really fit in right. I don't know what was going on there, but I think the Lord um, does these things to test us. I mean, these things, you know, happen more for us, for our generation. And I think the Lord, you know, wants to test us, you know, at this time period, like, who are we following? Are we following God? Are we following man? That's what the test is about. Who is your leader? And I've showed you the statement, you know, from Ellen White, what she said about William Miller and the 2520. The two charts which she endorsed, you know, she corrects that mistake. She tells it was a figure, not mistakes, one mistake, not just a reckoning of the time. And we see that illustrated in the 1850 chart, and she endorses Brother Nichols' chart. So, you know, we need to be a bit more wise when we put these um, arguments. And I think many people who are about 2520 haven't even studied it themselves. What they're doing is that they're listening to these sermons of eloquent, intelligent men, you know, who say these things, you know, people, you know, that have been correct in many other stuff that they've preached. And they think, oh, well, I mean, these men have such a huge following. I mean, they've spoken so much truth in the past. I mean, they can never be wrong. But well, that's part of the test, you see. We tested upon our relationship with Christ, how we study these things. Because some of these people may be genuine at that time in their understanding. And you know, you don't know how the Lord works, but then you end up being lost because you're just following men rather than, you know, following God. So I think it's dangerous ground we're treading on. We need to learn to study these things for ourselves. Now, in regards to Stephen Bohr, I absolutely adore him. He's really dear to my heart because, you know, he really helped me understand the foundations of Adventism when I was coming into the faith, Ellen White, I mean, it's because of him I believed in Ellen White, you know, in the beginning, at that time. So he's always been dear to my heart, but because I've learned so much from him, it doesn't mean that I just take his words as that saith the Lord now, and I just follow him. I mean, everything that he says, I have to go back and test it myself. I need to build my own experience and understand, because if I'm just following him, because of what he done for me in the past, man, then I'm going to be lost, you know. Um, you know, the Bible says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. Now, we're in serious times. The deception is so high. And we must spend so much time in prayer and, and in humility. And even when we understand, if we don't understand something, or if even if later on we realise that, oh, no, you know, it's more light has come, you know, I was wrong. There's nothing wrong with saying that you were wrong. I mean, a lot of people, you know, as light increases and they see the errors in their way, but because they've made such bold statements, because they don't want to humble themselves, they feel it their duty because of their pride to continue on teaching error when deep down they know it's error, but because they don't want to humble themselves over account, because they want to be seen as wrong, they still continue. And I think that's a, a very, very dangerous path to tread on. And as I mentioned, you know, this is a testament of Jesus Christ that is attacked here. And I do feel obliged to do this message and try to, you know, get people to try and understand these things. 
Another argument people use to attack 2520 is found in the Great Controversy. And I'll just read it, what she says. She tells us, The experience of the disciples who preached the gospel of the kingdom at the first advent of Christ had its counterpart in the experience of those who proclaimed the message of his second advent. As disciples went out preaching the time to fulfill the kingdom of God is at hand, so Miller and his associates proclaimed that the longest and last prophetic period brought to view in the Bible was about to expire, that the judgment was at hand and that the everlasting kingdom was to be ushered in. Full stop. Next sentence. The preaching of the disciples in regards to the time was based on the 70 weeks of Daniel 9. The message given by Miller and his associates announced that the termination of the 2,300 days of Daniel 8.14 of which 70 weeks form a counterpart for my part. The preaching of chin of each was based upon the fulfillment of a different portion of the great prophetic, of the same great prophetic period. The Great Controversy, page 351. So a lot of people read this statement and because they already have preconceived ideas in their head, they um, go around saying, oh, she said the 2,300 day was the greatest prophecy, the great prophetic period which the Millerite preached. But she's not saying that. It's two different sentences. I thought we need to be smart. She talks about William Miller and his associates preaching the great prophetic period. The time was about to expire. And we know, according to, the, to what's been written from William Miller, and from um, Josiah Lynch and all the others that, you know, they believed in 2520 and that they preached it according to historic documentation and by their writings, we know. So what is the great prophetic period which they preached out of all the tour, the greatest prophecy? Is that the 2520? And then she goes on to compare the 2,300 days and the 70 weeks. You know, out of the 2,300 days, you know, the 70 weeks, you know, so part of the 2,300 days and the 70 weeks, is the longest, and the, sorry, the 2500 day prophecy is the longest out of 70 weeks when you compare the two in that context. But she's not saying, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's crazy how people come to these conclusions. And the reason why is because they have a preconceived idea, they haven't prayed to the Lord and humbled themselves and asked Him, you know, show me your truth. Let me not just study this Bible to hold on to preconceived ideas because if you come to the Word of God with your own preconceived idea, you want to settle that for yourself, then you will find stuff. Just like many others try and find arguments to dispute the Sabbath, they go to Colossians and so on, saying, you know, Sabbath is not important. You mustn't do that, you know. We can't come to the Bible with our own preconceived ideas. We need to come, humble ourselves, ask Him to know what's true. So, I mean, we can't use that as an argument. I have yet to see a statement where Ellen White, uh, says the 25 the 2300 day prophecy is the longest and great prophetic or rightly in its context um i have yet to see a statement where ellen white denounces 2520 and says it's error i'm still waiting to see those things so um yeah let's let's just be wise here now some of you may be wondering you know what's the significance of the 2520 well, the Apostle tells us that all these things happen unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So these things we know they are written for our admonition, they happen as ensamples for us at the end of the world. And we know, I think what we need to take home, one of the important things we need to understand is that we know Israel was a chosen people from God, but it was conditional, you know, in terms of them being the people of God. They had to hearken unto his covenant. They had to hearken unto the words of the Lord. And part of the words of the Lord was that they shouldn't go unto the other fallen nations like Babylon, you know, and intermingle with them in terms of their worship styles. But they continually did this and worshiped their false gods, the Babylonian gods. And because they didn't hearken unto their covenant, they were scattered. They were no more people of God. Now, we as an Adventist church, I mean, we are called to bear a solemn and important message, the further angels' message. We are called to be distinguished from the distinguished from the world. And we are not to, you know, go to the fallen churches of Babylon, the daughters included, and bring their spurious teachings back into the house of God. Because when we do that, when we start to lead God's people astray, we will cease from being 
a part of that covenant and it will result in again the king of the north the papacy rising again you know to try and scatter god's people you know but we know obviously saint adventist is the last church you know but the fact of the matter is is that we have the worst rebuke and the fact of the matter is again is that the majority of people adventism especially the leaders ain't gonna make it's only gonna be a few a remnant so there's lessons there for us to learn that just because the Lord has given us great light, you know, has you know given us his law and so on, you know, has made us the chosen people of God, you know, there's a condition attached, you know, we must obey the covenant and do his word. So the same principle, you know, remains. But you know, we know that after I need to make this point clear because that after eighteen forty four there's no time prophecy. We know that we're not there's no time designated where I you know, we're going to be scattered for this amount of time. 2520 is not going to repeat the time period. No, 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 no time prophecy, 1844. But it's just a principle, the spiritual thing, you know, that's being taught here, you know. And in regards to 2520, you know, I believe it's a great prophecy. But there are some people that are fanatical about it and they go around saying, if you don't we want 2520, you're going to be lost and so on. And they make a big deal out of it. And I don't think that's a smart way to win people. You need to be wise. I think there's a bigger picture going on. And I think there's more, um, there's more, it, it digs much deeper than just having a knowledge of the 2520. There's much deeper things that are at stake, you know, that the Lord wants us to understand and his work in the sanctuary and the work he's doing for us. And yet, the 2520 is a part of that, but it's not the central focus as many people make it out to be. There's bigger things happening. I'll cover that hopefully in future presentations. But I just really want to put it on record that 2520, you know, it does stand. It's a great prophecy. It does no damage. I mean, someone said to me, um, why, you know, are you so bang on the 2520 which took me by surprise because i've never even done a message on the 2520 on my channel i've never really spoken about it because i'm not fanatical as many people are and she says all you people want to do is bring a new light you just want to be seen as bringing a new light which again caught me by surprise because 2520 is not new light <laughs> we've just seen it it's not new light it's old light i mean but it, it gives power to the new it ain't no new teaching you know, it's in the Bible that's been hidden through the traditions of men. It's not new light. It's, it's always been there, if you understand what I'm saying. So, yeah, I mean, we need to stop being children in these matters and just look at the bigger picture and understand what the Lord wants us to understand. Now, I'd like to close on this statement. She tells us, from the spirit of prophecy, she tells us, The warning has come. Nothing is to be allowed to come in that will disturb the foundations of the faith upon which we have been building ever since the message came in 1842, 43 and 44. What she says, nothing. You see, there's an underground work going on here to destroy the foundations of Adventism. And she says, nothing should be allowed to do that. Nothing. She continues, I was in the message and ever since I have been standing before the world, true to the light that God has given us, we do not propose to take our feet off the platform on which they were placed as day by day we sought the Lord with earnest prayer, seeking for light. Do you think that I could give up the light that God has given me? It is to be the rock of ages. It has been guiding me ever since it was given. And that's Jesus, the rock of all ages. It all points to him. All those things on the chart, 2520, it means nothing. If you can't see Christ in that chart, and in that chart, Christ is the focus, the center, the foundation. Ellen White tells us another statement, the true foundation is character building. So many people out there who do have knowledge of the 2520 and the prophecies, but it doesn't make you saved automatically. You know, what we're tested upon is our character, is character building. And we all need to recognize that, that we need to become like Christ. And that's a tall order. In my opinion, anyone could understand the prophecy if they want to, but to become like Christ, I mean, to be humble, I mean, to not get angry and lose your temper, and to love those that hate you. That's the true test, and that's what we should be aiming for. I think the prophecies, well, for me, they just established to me that God is in control, and I marvel at his wisdom and at his love, you know. 
Now that also makes him God, him being able to portray the end from the beginning, to tell us these things, to give the 2520, the exact date, 1790, ending the 1844, all those things, it gives power. And because of the and because we see these things, you'll be a fool to know, to think that God doesn't exist. But now we understand that he's real, we need to also understand the power of his word and that power also not only being able to portray the end from the beginning but also being able to transform us into his image into his character and i believe that's what we all should be aiming for at this time because i really do believe we're in the last generation and there's a lot of struggles um, going on among each and every one of us and it's the time where we need to be trying to encourage one another humbling ourselves before the Lord, being of one mind, one accord, because the last day church, you know, the remnant, within the remnant, will be of one mind. And that's what we should be aiming to do. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, it's a short presentation. I don't, there's a lot more that you can go into 2520, but I don't feel impressed with that, to be honest. But if you want to know a bit more about 2520, there's a really good website, which I'm going to post below, which really goes into it, I think is very good. Um, yeah, if you've got any questions, feel free to post them below, and I'll try and get back to you. And I thank you for your time. Take care.